Hello, everybody. Welcome back from watching um, the documentary, The Wolf Mountains. We are here now with Eric. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for being us uh, with us here today. <laughs> it was really nice to see your movie. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was really nice insight into how wilderness can develop if nature is left alone, but also about different struggles that this wilderness in Slovakia, Poland, and Ukraine might have. So yeah, maybe you can just shortly introduce yourself and let us know a little bit more about how this movie came together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed the uh, film and you like it. So maybe I would say something about um, uh, me and my activities in Slovakia first, because uh, I'm not um, just a filmmaker. First of all, I'm a conservationist. And the uh, first project or conservation project which we made uh, was in Tatra Mountains. It is a national park in Slovakia where in the 1990s, there was a logging everywhere in all nature reserves. There was hunting. So it was not real national park. And we started campaign to protect um, uh, bigger areas in uh, this national park. And most of all, Ticha Valley and Koprova valleys. These are two quite big valleys in the center of the national park. And uh, so we worked hard, maybe 15 years to achieve uh, conservation in, in uh, this area. And now in Tatra National Park, it is still not uh, well managed, but we really have uh, quite big wildernesses here. So we have Ticha and Kuoprova Valley, and then some other areas as well, all together uh, if we include Polish site, it is 550 square kilometers of wilderness. So I think we have one of the best wildernesses here in Slovakia, thanks to conservation campaigns, which we made together with conservationists, scientists and other people, and all the time against government. And part of uh, this campaign was uh, our first film, uh, with, with the name Keeper of the Wilderness. So we were successful uh, also thanks to filmmaking. So that's uh, why we took an idea to make another film in a in Wolf Mountain region, because uh, we had a great imagination about uh, European wilderness. Maybe, you know, we can imagine wilderness in Africa, in North America or some other in Siberia, uh, but not in Europe. And uh, there are not many places in Europe where we can rewild areas. And this is really special because we have three countries, three different national parks together. There are not many people. So and it was an idea to help uh, better conservation in this region and to show all the European Europeans how wilderness should look like in Europe. So it was quite difficult uh, to make this film because even if you can find all those species which you saw in the film, they are still very rare. For example, it was very difficult to film wolves. And I worked with uh, two filmmakers, Karol Kaliski and Josef Fiala, and those two guys, they spend hundreds of days in the field waiting for animals. So many times they came, uh, you know, to certain place, sit for 10 days, wait for animals, and there was nothing in the end. And then another 10 days, and then again, again. So <laughs> it was not easy, but uh, in the end, I think it was quite successful and uh, yeah. We still work with some uh, partners in Poland and Ukraine about the idea to help uh, uh, to to help better protection of this huge region. But uh, so this is for for maybe for discussion as well. So th that's yeah. all from the beginning, and I am waiting for your answer uh, <laughs> questions. Sorry. Thank you so much for the insight. 
I saw there was a scene where it, there was a lot of snow and then you could see the filmmakers in the tents beneath the snow. So it must have been really <laughs> a struggle sometimes to get all these amazing shots, but it for sure was worth it at the end. Um, so yeah, let's see if we've got any questions. Um, if not, I'm going to ask you something because I have a lot. <laughs> Uh, I cannot hear you. No, um, I'm, I'm back, I'm back, don't worry. Um, yeah, you mentioned that um, in winter, um, a lot of these animals that are usually higher up in the mountains have to come down due to the winter conditions and they go down into areas that are not that wild um, where humans are intervening. Um, there's logging, there might be hunting. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, on that. How, how the human wildlife, human wildlife conflict is in that area. Yes. Uh, so I, I cannot show you a map now, but uh, if, if you can imagine Bieszczady National Park is higher in the mountains. And then uh, Sun River Valley is more down and the boundary between national park and non-national park area is somewhere in the middle. So almost all big animals go down from the mountains to spend winter. And there is uh, heavy hunting in this uh, area down. We have seen uh, many, many animals killed by hunters. You know, in, in the beginning of winter, when there is still hunting season, you see blood, you know, in, on, on the roads, in the forest, it's really, there are many animals, but there is still a lot of hunting. And I can imagine that without this hunting, we can see much more animals than we saw. Uh, it's, but this is problem uh, in all Europe, I think. We have the same problem in Tatra National Park. It is high in the mountains. Everything will be protected. And down, there is a little left. And we need... Uh, uh, better protection on lowlands or lower areas where animals can migrate and spend winter time. Because if we don't have uh, these areas, we are still losing ec very important ecological processes. I think it's like ecological pyramid. We have uh, vegetation, then there are herbivores and then carnivores, scavengers and others. So if we don't have enough herbivores, or I, I don't know how much is enough, but as nature wants, you know, if nature, if you leave nature for itself, you will see. And probably, I think we will have plenty animals and maybe on some places, uh, no trees, you know, and we will see changes in nature, which we don't expect now. But there is no place in Europe where you can see these ecological processes. And that's that's a big problem. And I think if we want to change something uh, in Europe from the perspective of wilderness conservation, we have to focus not on more and more small areas, but we have to create at least few, but really big. Yeah, and also including lowlands, like you said, not just the mountains that are already really hard to access for humans, but also the, the areas that are easy to access. That's right. Related to that, we've got the question from Camilla. She asks, did you experience any direct conflict between the cameraman and hunters or locals during filming? Um, there were not really conflicts. From the beginning, they didn't know that we are there because we had permission from the National Park Authority and we were allowed to film. And nobody knows that uh, from the foresters and hunters that we are on place. But um, a bit later, I think they, we, uh, close to the Sun River, when, they're, uh, when hunting season starts, they saw us that we are filming there. We were filming there. And uh, uh, my feeling was that they don't like to be filmed as a, as a hunters. So they were afraid and they start to go with cars 
to the Sun River where we wanted to film animals. So they tried to chase away animals and chase away us from the area because they won't, wanted to hunt. So that was only small conflict. But as I know, uh, later on, after we made this film, many photographers from whole Poland came to this area. And this was bigger conflict because hunters were not sure where are heights of all those photographers, you know, <laughs> and they, they really had conflicts with hunters. But as a result, we have seen much bigger packs of wolves because um, the wolf hunting in Poland is not legal, but there is illegal hunting all the time. But after all those uh, photographers came to the area, nobody <laughs> was able to hunt wolves illegally. So the result is that now uh, wolf packs are bigger than before. And it is much more easy to see wolves in this area than when we filmed. That's a benefit for the photographers then. <laughs> and for wolves, of course. Exactly, also. Um, that's very interesting. Um, so Vlado says that there is no doubt that that film has a strong impact on people. Do you have knowledge on how many people have seen this film already during previous years? Uh, I have no idea, but uh, the good thing was that um, this film was shown on Nat Geo, Nat Geo Wild in uh, almost 120 countries uh, in, in the world. So <laughs> I, I hope many people saw this film and then we had chance to show film also in uh, some, I don't know, there were some other televisions in Italy or for example, in South America, Discovery, in South America, I don't know, many, many countries, but I, I don't have exact numbers about uh, viewers. So Has it been translated to Spanish, for example, or is it always in English? Uh, I'm sure that it is translated in Spanish, if okay, it that's is, but I, I, I didn't see Spanish <laughs> version. We just found a distributor and he takes care about everything. So I, I just see where the film was and nothing else. Okay, nice. Um, so how was the national and international response to the movie? Like example from local communities in the area of foresters or hunters, did they respond somehow to the screening of the movies and to what they've seen? Mm. Uh, I think some of them, they are proud of, proud of uh, this area there is more public discussion now in Slovakia about this area. I think many people saw more tourists. Uh, I remember first the years after we released this film, I, I personally, I met uh, a lot of tourists um, who saw our film before from Netherlands, for example, and they came uh, to this area to see wolves. Of course, they didn't see anything because it's difficult <laughs> to see animals. But um, yeah, th there is uh, uh, some impact of this film, but it is uh, not enough. You have to work on many things, you know, to achieve something in the area. It's quite difficult. This is just a small part of uh, our conservation project. Yeah, documentaries are really a very efficient way to show people and give them an insight into wilderness because, as you said, it's really hard to see these things and experience these things. But with the technology we have right now, it's quite accessible. So that's really nice. What I can say was a big change for us is that uh, after we released this film and it was shown in, on National Geographic, we had much more possibilities to work on other films with other companies. So we, we are not interested that much because we want to work about uh, our ideas and uh, some conservation projects. But uh, we have seen this uh, change <laughs> that many, many producers ask us to work with them. That's great. Um, so Hannah asks, um, 
Well, she says that in conservation, charismatic species like the wolf tend to get all the attention because they have a better appeal to the public. Um, does wildlife filmmaking follow a similar pattern? Sorry. Uh, um, so, for example, the wolf is a very charismatic species, so the public yeah. likes to see it um, on television and in documentaries, but maybe a documentary about insects is yeah, more yeah. difficult to make and to distribute. Is wildlife filmmaking yeah. following this trend? Uh, so I, I think if you want to make, um, so that there are two possibilities. The one is that you can use animal as a bear and uh, tell a story about the ecosystem. It is possible because bear is connected to dead wood because there, there is uh, ant, for example, and it is food or whatever, you can find these connections and the same with wolf or other charismatic species. And the second thing is to work really with insect or species like this, but you have to find uh, another story, something very special. For example, I have a story of scientist who is, uh, you know, working on this issue all his life and you can tell a story of his life and show insect or you can find very innovative technologies like micro technologies and you can show first time uh, in the world you know something new and then you can have success but other way it's not possible people are not interested in birds you know they need a big fury animal yeah i i understand <laughs> So Vladu asks, um, what currently your priority is? Are you working on wilderness or what are you working on? Yeah. Um, I have many projects in the beginning. Uh, um, for example, today I was in uh, Tiha Valley. I, I mentioned this valley before. And uh, I took an idea to uh, to make something like virtual education paths. Because in our national parks, you don't have information about uh, what's going on in nature. People, for example, see dead trees and they don't understand. They can cry, the trees are dying. And you can explain them that dead wood is very important because of store carbon, water, insect, lichens. And then you, you can make path about dead wood and explain visitors of the national park why that wood is important. And the same you can make from different perspectives, from the history to Copper Cayley, whatever. And it is, it is quite easy. You can make an app, app application to your mobile phone and you go to the wilderness as a normal tourist and then you, you hear a ring uh, that there is something interesting and you can see video and uh, we can explain to you something about nature. So this is one of my projects, but yes. I would like to make also another film about uh, water because water is very important and uh, uh, we have climate change as one of the biggest problems of all. So, and water is connected with climate change. And my feeling is that the people don't understand water as well and I would like to make something more educative. Uh, maybe use some uh, animations as well to explain how water works in nature. What is important to have water and life in our European landscape. So that's the idea. Nice. Um, so this application, as you said, you walk through wilderness and then when you reach a specific point, you get like a notification. Like look here you can yes. find yes. something interesting that's really nice yeah. i <laughs> hope it will be successful we can we want to make uh only tatra national park uh, till uh, next spring and if it will be successful we would like to extend to other areas in slovakia so. okay so camilla asks um do you also consider setting up some live cameras for people to be able to observe nature from their homes? Uh, 
I have no experiences with uh, these live cameras, but I, I think it's it's good idea. We have some uh, people in State Nature Conservancy, and I saw that they can develop uh, nice stories. If there is, for for example, an eagle nest and people watching what what uh, chicks are doing, what they eat, how they fight <laughs> together, or so, um, yeah. It, it is one of uh, the possibilities and new technologies bring you much more possibilities for the future and young people like to use these new te technologies. So we have to think this way to be successful. Yeah, and especially right now during coronavirus, it's for people it's much more, getting much more interesting to get out in nature and then from their homes if they can learn yeah. something about the process. Yeah. Also, people, people are getting depressed from Corona and we have to say them, to tell them, go to the wild. <laughs> nature is a Corona-free zone. <laughs> you can experience more nature and be more healthy. Yeah, definitely. Get some fresh air helps, helps the brain as well. <laughs> so Gintara asked, um, what was the most inspiring moment during filming? Um, during the filming of the documentary for you? Yeah, the Wall of Mountains, probably, yeah. yeah. So to me, I, I was, uh, as director of the film, I wasn't behind camera all the time. So I had different experiences that, uh, than filmmakers. But uh, I remember in the beginning, the first observation of uh, European bisons in the forest, it was very impressive. So it, it's so big animal. <laughs> I, I was not scared, but I didn't expect. I saw hundreds of bears before and deers, and then you see bison, and it's like, wow. <laughs> but I, I really like, for example, beavers. To me, it was most interesting from my, uh, per, from my ecological perspective. So I, I'm interested how nature works. And if when I saw beaver dams, I understood why it is so important because there is a uh, structure everywhere in the water. So if you have no structure in the water, like uh, grass or branches or whatever, then you, you don't have uh, life in the water. And beaver dams are full of structures and there is light and everything. And uh, there is much more life than on any other places. So this was uh, surprising for me because before I, I read that yeah, beavers are important, but on this place, I saw how important they are. Yeah, and in the movie, I, I remember the scene, seeing the scene now um, in the water with all the frogs and the little tadpoles, okay. and it was really um, displayed very, very good. Um, so. Well, beavers are also a quite difficult topic for humans because they say they um, disturb the rivers, like they disturb the natural flow of the river, but you're saying it's not really true. It's like the other way around, right? No worries. Sorry, <laughs> can, can you repeat what you said? No, I'm just wondering about the human wildlife conflict of like the human and the beaver because the beaver kind of disturbs the work that humans did with rivers and then the other way around. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, <laughs> depends on, you know, the, there are some conflicts, but, uh, you know, for example, we in Slovakia, we have a landscape where there are not many people, big uh, parts of the streams, and then there is small village. And then again, there is space for beavers and if a uh, landscape is not uh, really flat, they cannot make uh, a lot of damage. So there are many, many places in Slovakia where can, they can build dams without any problems with humans. So, but there are, I, I'm not an expert how to solve problems with beavers, but I know that there are some uh, mechanisms how to prevent damages. And Camilla asks, um, oh, do you think that humans could learn something um, from the structure of the beavers, like how the beavers structure the environment? Could it increase biodiversity? 
Yes, I, I think uh, the uh, structure is very important in all the ecosystems. And it is uh, important to think about it. If you, if you are in the forest, you see big trees and you know that you can find eagle nest, for example, or black stork nest on big tree. And then you have small shrubs down in the forest and you can find different species of birds. Then you have dead wood and you, you know that it is important for woodpecker. Then you have, you know, conifer trees, different species than broadleaf trees. And you understand that more structured it is, more life you have in forest. And it is the same in lake, in the river. In the river, you have shallow water, deep water, you know, some shadow like uh, fallen trees in the water uh, help fish to escape from otter. Uh, change water flow structure is crucial in every stream, every river, every uh, forest, every pasture, every meadow. It's all about structure. If you, if you want to have diverse life in any kind of ecosystem, you have to think about structures. Nice, thank you. That's a, that's a very, very important point, yeah. Um, so Hannah says, not strictly, strictly related to the movie, but the Min Ministry of Agriculture of Slovakia just two days ago sat together to decide on the annual quota, um, sorry, oh, okay, on the annual quota for the shooting of wolves. I haven't read anything about the decision yet. Do you have an insight? Yeah. Um. <laughs> I have some information, but as I know, uh, this group of people didn't find a final decision because there is uh, how it was created in a bad way. The people from hunting lobby have more members than conservationists, but the uh, Minister of Agriculture is more on conservation side, let's say, but this group was not able to find a solution. and. I don't know how they will solve this problem. I have to meet with Minister of Agriculture on Friday, so I can ask and I can tell you more later, but uh, I would like to speak with him about uh, other problems. We, we have much uh, bigger problems with um, state land and uh, conservation on state land. So we have national parks where there is a lot of state land owned by government, but it is managed by uh, Ministry of Agriculture and State Forests. It is not managed by a conservationist. And this is uh, the most important um, from the perspective of uh, wilderness conservation in Slovakia to move this land under Ministry of Environment. And this is uh, how I want to speak with the uh, minister this Friday. <laughs> so just, uh, yeah. All right, exciting times um, coming up. So yeah, it's almost over the half an hour of discussion we've got. Thank you so much for, for coming here. Um, I didn't don't see any more questions, so let's wrap it up. And well, we all look forward to the next work that we can, can see from your side. <laughs> I hope we will meet uh, personally once. <laughs> so. That would be very nice. You're always welcome in, in Austria here, of course, if you want to come and visit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you so thank much you all and have a nice day yeah you too bye, bye. <laughs>